Всі розслабилися, вже сонливі, дрімливі, так, так що ми мусимо вас всіх... I'm sorry, wrong country, wrong language. Uh, everybody's a bit uh, drowsy at this point, and uh, you take your choice. Uh, Perk you up. Uh, we have an audience that's from the and from the rest of the world, so we sort of have to establish a basis of knowledge. Uh, uh, we, we're talking about uh, communicating reforms. I think that's essentially what we're talking about. We know that reforms are never easy. People, especially in Ukraine, have gotten accustomed to, for more than a duration, generation, to a continuation of a very, between a continuation of a very paternalistic system and also a very brutal experience, as well, uh, in which living standards, depressions, and everything else occurred, uh, mass immigration, uh, demographic issues, etc. So uh, Ukraine has sort of been suffering because of the lot of suffering. So, which is the perception of people. People perceive that they've suffered because of reforms, and they actually suffered, suffered because of a lack of reforms. Um, and of course, we, we know that government is working against enormous, enormous resistance. Uh, if you walk through the halls of the cabinet, minister, you see, the cabinet minister, ministers, you see that changes have occurred. Uh, you don't see any more old people. Everybody that I see walking down the halls are young young people. When you see an older person, you'd sort of look at them and say, um, yeah, well, we don't have that. <laughs> and I'm younger. Uh, so, uh, yeah, young people in place, most of them from outside of government, trying to uh, affect changes, again, considerable resistance, uh, and the lack of progress and slow reforms are very often blamed on the people who uh, obviously are responsible for carrying them out, not on those who are resisting. So it's going on Savik uh, Schuster. Channel one, two, is very, very dubious funding. I mean, the word, you know, the word on the street is that this is an offshore investment from somebody who's hanging out in Moscow these days. Um, and uh, after a little while, uh, Schuster is known for his very for exciting discussions, representing different points of view, suddenly yields the floor to a person who used to be a prime minister and who proceeds to attack reforms as genocide. Honestly, this was the first time that there was any serious, massive, significant uh, representation of reforms to the Ukrainian public. Because everything else is, you know, press conference, a press, press briefing, media center, etc. There is no rollout of a campaign to represent reforms to the public. There was a discussion at the energy session downstairs, and the minister replied, well, every week I give a press briefing. Do, I, do we have to do so? I mean, these are rhetorical questions. They're obvious things. Now, on the other hand, you can say, now we've had some discussions. We attempted to have at this session two representatives of the major channels. They're not here. <laughs> um, why aren't they here? Well, who owns these channels? Are these people interested in reform? Will reform deprive them of So I think we have a very difficult challenge of making sure that mass channels become effective instruments of communicating reforms. I'm afraid here. Okay. Uh, introduction, hopefully everybody's awake now, primed. Let's roll. Uh, uh, Professor Roland. Uh, well, um, thank you very much. In, indeed, uh, communication is, is absolutely a, a, key, uh, um, a key problem. Uh, but I'll, I'll be very brief because the topic we were asked to talk about is popular support for reform. So, so to what extent can you do it? What are some basic principles of it? And how can this be applied to Ukraine? So uh, uh, let me just you know, mention, because I've, I've actually worked a lot on this uh, uh, in my career. Let me just mention a few uh, important principles. One is uh, a right uh, sequencing of reforms. So, so uh, you have to think of uh, how you, you sequence the reforms. You know, reforms, it's uh, reform strategy, you have to think a little bit as battles. And uh, when you're a general and there's a battle, you know, there are some 
you know, some flanks that you really have to be successful in. And so, so, so the idea uh, with the sequencing of reform, very briefly, is very, very important to create momentum for reform. That's the idea. That is that you want to start with success. That is that the reforms have to reach their goal and they have to be understood. And uh, if the reforms are successful, then you can pass on to the to the uh, uh, to, to the next reform, and so so that's a way of gradually building more and more support for reforms. People are dubious; they're uncertain, uh, uh, and and uh, you know when when you do long-term reforms, reforms that are not you know I'm not talking here about macroeconomic stabilization, which has actually different principles, but when we're thinking of institutional reform. Have to uh, think of sequencing and uh, be successful in the beginning and build momentum. That's one, uh, that's one principle. Another principle is that you need to uh, use windows of opportunity to create a reversibility. These windows of opportunity, they come and go, and when they are there, you know, the timing has, you have to be forceful, you have to use them and uh, create the reversibility, that is make reforms that if at any point, uh, uh, there are going to be some political change that they're going to be more difficult to uh, uh, this principle has been applied a lot for example in in uh, Eastern Europe a third principle is the what is called the dual track idea the dual track idea that was actually implemented very successfully in China is uh, the idea is that uh, one should uh, um, uh, in a way leave rents to lose Losers, uh, so as to minimize resistance to efficiency enhancing reforms. So, so what they did in China uh, was uh, they uh, did not dismantle the planning system right away, but they allowed enterprises to uh, go on the market track. Uh, and then in this way, uh, uh, many managers who might have been afraid of, of losing rents could get rents and become involved in the uh, market process. And then uh, um, control the agenda. This is absolutely important. If there is a reform process, the people who are in power have to control the agenda. If they let the opposition or if they let the people who are opposed to reform to define the agenda, then they're going to be in a defensive position. You have to be in an offensive position. That is, you have to, you know, and there's this, if you don't control the agenda, you cannot be in an offensive position. Uh, then there has to to be commitment for compensation of losers because obviously in any large-scale reform there will have to be compensation so we're talking about uh, energy reform uh, downstairs a bit earlier it's quite clear uh, that in this case when you want to have full market prices for energy you do want to uh, uh, you know uh, have uh, um, basically special compensation especially for the poor people but saying you will do that is not enough there has to be commitment and otherwise people have to believe that you will, uh, you know, these are hard reforms, these are reforms that, that are a big shock, and you have to be credible, you have to show commitment to uh, losers. And uh, um, finally, and this is actually very important, is to institutionalize commitment, because commitment is just not about, hey, I'm making a promise, you have to believe me, that's just not enough. You have to change the rules the people can believe you. There's a very famous uh, uh, book by Asimoglu and Robinson showing that uh, 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 establishing democracy already early from the 20th century was a way the poor members of society and, and, and that, uh, that, that was actually a, a, key, a key role here. And I, I talked a bit about institutional change in Ukraine is a key condition in order to create commitment so that the rules are going to be changed, so that the people can be empowered, so that the right decisions may be taken. Now, these are general principles, and so uh, a few uh, ideas, the way I see things, you know, this is, of course, a, a debate, and we should uh, debate about it. Uh, as I said yesterday, it seems to me uh, that, uh, uh, of course, you know, you, you need to do, there, there are many urgent reforms. Uh, uh, do uh, um, uh, you know the change in gas tariffs is very urgent to deregulate. There, there are many urgent things that that do not wait. But in terms of if you're thinking in terms of strategy, in terms of strategy, 
as I argued yesterday, I think that changing the Constitution, changing the Constitution uh, in a way that it's an inclusive process, that the civil society is part of it, that it's transparent, etc., something that can create momentum. Because if people don't believe the rules, then the rules are not going to work. If people help decide the new rules that are perceived as legitimate, then this is going to create solid basis for further reform process. And uh, so this is a way of thinking of institutionalizing of commitment. Uh, uh, you know, this is a little bit the Asimoglu Robinson ideas, but, but implemented here in the context of uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, gas price liberalization, I think, is a very good example of the dual track. It's really key to have efficient resource allocation, which means that one has to, uh, uh, and I think one is going in the right direction, but you know, getting to market pricing in terms of gas, energy, is something absolutely crucial. That's good for resource allocation. But here one has to be you know, really careful to make sure that poor people you know, get at least a minimum amount, or either get a lump sum or get some form of redistribution while giving them incentives to save uh, uh, money. And then, and actually, uh, Mr. Rogush said it already before, but I, I think I should really repeat it, that communication here is, is absolutely important given the destabilization campaign from Putin. When I hear that somebody says that, that reforms is the genocide, I mean, this is such an outrageous declaration. People should go in the streets to, to it's a shame. that You have to shame people who, who, who say this is really, you know, this. Uh, so communication is very, very important. Uh, uh, and um, as much as I'm sympathetic to this uh, government, I think there's just not enough attention in terms of the mess a lot on fiscal reform. But, you know, is this something professional? You, you know, the the... the the few sentences that you're going to uh, uh, come up with to explain things to the public have to be worked out professionally. That's you know just like private firms have their PR. Uh, a, a government, especially in the context of Ukraine, where everything is changing, you need absolutely professional PR, uh, uh, and that's something uh, absolutely key. Finally, I mentioned the control of the agenda. Putin is trying to control the agenda trying to control the agenda from day one, as I said yesterday, trying to destabilize the democratic experience in Ukraine, and uh, he wants the uh, emphasis to be on the war. Uh, he wants people who fought in the Maidan to all go and focus on that. He wants the attention diverted from institutional reform. One should not let Putin control the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My suggestion is that perhaps instead of some preordained order, which uh, I would conceive of, perhaps we could just begin by whoever wants to speak next uh, to, to, to provide continuity. Do you want to do continuity? Do you want to do, you want to do a round of Okay. Sir, thank you. No, no I, I um, was keen to, to, to speak now because I thought that um, what I'm going to say is very ties very uh, nicely into what Shira was saying. So. so the more I've been involved in, in thinking and, and, and uh, trying to play a role in, in reforms, the more I've been convinced that what George Logos started with is so s central, that the narrative that you create around the reforms you're implementing are absolutely essential. And um, to be honest, I th think we haven't been very successful to create this narrative, certainly not um, the way uh, Ukraine is perceived outside Ukraine, and I, I think it's even more a, a problem here. And, and that's why it's so important that we have people like uh, Ivan Miklos here and, 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 and others coming, bringing an experience and, and a personal experience uh, to uh, that uh, uh, narrative. And, and, and actually, what I'm building now at, at the, the London School of Economics, I will hire a particular professor in history because uh, who studies uh, the history of, of transitions because of this incredible importance that I attach to, to, to the narrative. So um, 
So I'm going to try to provide a narrative, a uh, very simple one, of, of, of the uh, reforms in, in, in Ukraine here. So, so, you know, first of all, I think it's very important, particularly when you're selling this outside Ukraine, say how important this is. That you, Ukraine, of course, and that's the Ukraine is a, a very important uh, economy, is strategically located. It's uh, very important it's in its own right. Really, you know, one of the reasons why I personally got involved is that I think this is also the key to getting reforms at some future point in, in Russia. A success in Ukraine will be incredibly important for what's happening in, in Russia. I think also for the European Union, it's a, a real litmus test to what can the soft powers of, of, of um, the European Union. And, and it's, you know, it's not about being uh, patronizing or, or, or uh, uh, through, uh, imposing policies. It's about really finding that fine balance between providing an, an anchor and, and a supportive process and engaging and, and making sure that you are fostering a reform locally. So that I think often for all those three reasons, this is an absolutely critical process. And, and so I'm going to focus on f sort of four elements of sustainability that I've seen over this last year when I have been more involved in, in Ukraine. And frankly, I, last year, I think I spent about half my time on, on Ukraine. And, and I think remarkable things have happened, and we, we forget them. You know, when, if you go one back, back one year ago, we didn't really have, a, we didn't have an elected president. We didn't have an elected... Uh, uh, Rada, we didn't have a, you know, a number of the elements, key elements on the re of the reform architecture. We didn't have government involved in politics at all at, at the time. Uh, so we've, we forget about how much has been achieved. And I think also in this conference, sometimes, of course, we should be critical, but we should also remember when we tell the narrative that so much has been achieved. So, so what I think has been achieved, and, and what I we're not all the way there, but we have, you know, a much more credible reform architecture in Ukraine now, and I'll come back to that in a minute. I think we need to spend much more time on making the results of, of reforms when their gas bills are being raised and so on, but we need also to show vision, I think, is absolutely key to Ukraine, and that with decentralization comes uh, participation and, and a sense of, of uh, evol involvement in the reform process. And uh, we need to ensure that so, so, there's been so much development in civil society in Ukraine, and it's probably, as some people have said, who, who has a lot of experience from, from uh, um, different uh, civil society movements, that Ukraine de developed civil society uh, in, in all of Europe. And um, I think the Vox Ukraine that I have... A, had the pleasure of following very closely over the last year is just one expression of how, how, how uh, powerful this uh, this uh, uh, movement is. But we need to find a way of making it sustainable, and as I said, communication and, and getting this transition narrative right. I won't go through all the obstacles, but I mean the political economy. I mean it's about. You know, the, the poor quality of economic and political institutions inherited, you know, the oligarchic structures of the government, you know, the very strong centralized heritage for Soviet times, the, the regional linguistic diversity, you know, there is uh, the strong dependence on Russia economically and, 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 and so on. So all these things are... are and the political context is, is not simple because when you look at the, the constitutional set up it's it's somewhere in the middle of it hasn't really uh, settled itself between you know a parliamentary system and a presidential system uh, you know the the parliament is a great success it has many new members but they're also inexperienced and and there is also now uh, with these difficult reforms tendencies to for uh, a more populist approaches to to gain ground uh, the coalition gov government is, is, um, is you know, it's 
five parties. It's remarkable when you look at the data. Vox Ukraine has done a fantastic analysis of, of voting uh, behavior in, in the RADA. It's remarkable how much it keeps together, but there are also some key decisions. There is uh, dissension, and that is, is, is very uh, dangerous. And, you know, we should be open. There are, you know, two political leaders came out of the elections more or less uh, equal. You know, they, it prevents this cohabitation that we have at the moment is not without friction, and, and it's something that I think we, we need to find ways of, of uh, developing. We have a radicalized civil society, as I said, but it's also, that's also a, a society that uh, you know, sometimes maybe goes overboard and needs to find ways of, so yes, of, of balancing. So here is just um, what I think is, has happened to and, and you know, a very key element of the uh, Ukrainian reform architecture. So, we have the ministries and the presidential administration, we have the RADA, we have civil society. This did not exist uh, a year ago, and I, I've talked to a lot of people over the last few days. This institution, this National Reform Council, is really starting to play a role. It's playing a role in, 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 in coordinating across very important across different ministries, and now pushing uh, implementation uh, and several ministers that I talked to now feel that this is really now starting to play a role for them. And it's also bringing in new people at market compensation uh, in, inside the government, uh, highly skilled people that are now devoting themselves to the development of Ukraine. And it's also engaging with civil society. I think this was not in place before. It's there now. It's starting to work. We should recognize it. Um, I think decentralization is key. I, I'll, I'll finish on this. Is um, impact of, of reforms when you uh, move down decisions to the local level. You need to consolidate, of course, to have uh, uh, sufficiently uh, sustainable units locally to, to move down decisions. But uh, uh, I think that's going to be in, in pushing forward. And, and um, so, and why is it so important? Well, it's, it's about really creating points of, of interaction with, with local uh, authorities and citizens. And uh, it can also allow this diversity that you have in Ukraine, and which is important to preserve. And, and you need to respond to that and, and that. Again, here, uh, Vox Ukraine, I think, has been a, a, a really a driver of trying to develop some of the elements of, of uh, decentralization. I think I, I'll stop with this. Thank you. Uh, Dimitri. Thank you very much. Uh, First, I want to, to start by congratulating the, the organizers because usually the, the late afternoon sessions, they are underattended, and here you see a huge overattendance, especially uh, given the sunny weather. So this is a big achievement, and they, they deserve big accolades. Uh, <laughs> to the weather and to the organizers, right? Uh, we, uh, in the EBRDI, I represent the European Bank for, for Reconstruction and Development, and uh, Eric, my former boss, a very good one. Uh, and well, what I want to say is that, uh, I mean, the, the reason I genuine trust into, uh, into this country and uh, the, the trust in, the, trust in the, the, the ability of the government to deliver. You know, we have been uh, looking at the, the, the reform steps which have been undertaken by the government. You know that the local political debate has been a bit cacophonous, like, you know, the, there are many stakeholders, many of them that the general course of action uh, is, in, uh, is the right one. And we're ready to support, basically, last year our, our annual business volume was in excess of 1 billion euros, uh, and we're planning to, to repeat the same, you know, and we invest into the bankable opportunities, which means that there are bankable opportunities in this country because we are ready to, to, to increase our portfolio exposure. Uh, the second thing which, which makes this country strong, I think, and the government accountable is a big strength of the civil society and of the, the, the media. I've been attending several sessions here, you know, uh, this afternoon. 
and the debate is professional, uh, the debate is genuine, and uh, unless you are prepared for that debate, you are right getting grilled by the people, you know, and that's very important, you know. Uh, uh, keep this country moving forward. Which I want to say about the, the, the popular support to reforms. First, you know, this country needs the international support. No matter how much they try, you know, the situation is really difficult, you know, and uh, the, there are these uh, imbalances which have been accumulating through the recent years and which are now unraveling. So the country needs a lot of international assistance. You know, the, the, the strengths and the, the magnitude of the exogenous shocks that the country is facing, you know, they, they call for the, uh, for the support by the international actors, economic but also political, unequivocal political assistance. Uh, second, then, that probably relates to the government, you know, uh, when tackling the vested interests, and we, we have seen the government trying to tackle the vested interests. Credibility, very important, you know, very important. I mean, you, you don't pull your punches if you go for some, something. And if you go after something, you just have to, to build up the credibility. You say that this is my red line, and I'm going to stick to that red line. And the people, they should understand the perimeters of that, uh, the, 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 those red lines. Uh, third, uh, you cannot have a successful Minister X and unsuccessful Minister Y. You know, for the ministers to be successful, the whole public sector has to be successful. Because the ministers, they, they tackle the vested interest in their areas. They, uh, the, the, they have to clamp down on corruption and so on and so forth. And, uh, like from our own experience, and I come from Georgia, you know, there, there were three types of the people. And I keep repeating the same thing like a mantra, but I mean, that, that worked. Uh, first, you know, the, the, the good technocracy, non-corrupt technocracy, cap capable technocracy, which would be able to deliver. The second pillar, which is exceptionally important, you know, the, the law enforcement, the prosecutor, the, the, the courts, and so on. Because without assistance from the law enforcement agencies, day-to-day -day enforcement agencies, it's going to be very difficult for the ministers to do things because they're going to feel themselves unprotected. So they need the back to be protected by the law enforcement agencies. And third, strategic communication. Keep reaching out to the people, you know, explaining what's going on, especially in this country's context, because we know that there are some interests which are standing behind certain TV channels, you know, behind newspapers and so on and so forth. So the government should be as proactive as possible, you know, to, to try to convey the message. Because these days when you present the case of Ukraine, you basically present the, the macro economic presentation about the challenges that Ukraine is facing, saying that the external refinance financing gap, according to the IMF, is $40 billion. This is not, not kind of the, the, the investment outreach and the, 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 the outreach effort in general that you need to make. So you have to start building up the, the investor value proposition for this country, you know, and this is the task of the government, but also the task of the, the civil society, trying to discern, you know, Uh, for us, uh, the role of the state, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the country is fighting the crisis now, but we, we believe that starting from the second half of this year, there's going to be the economic rebound and the growth will uh, important to incrementally, like in a piecemeal uh, manner, uh, decreasing the role of the state of the, in the economy. You now have the, the, the public expenditure, the expenditure of the general government as a percentage of the GDP. If I'm not mistaken, at 47% this year, it's very close to 50%. You may have 50%, you know, in the, the Nordic welfare states in Europe, you know, because that they've built up the welfare and now they can offer themselves, you know, offer, like avail themselves of this, this opportunity, but not now. So really start deregulating, start deregulating, start decreasing Start decreasing the size of the state. Sorry. Uh, all right, all right. Uh, uh, yeah, start decreasing the size of the state. That's very important, you know. And by, by making the government action, you're going to be actually crowding in the, 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 the private sector. And last but not least, you know, I mean, leadership is all, always a very personal phenomenon. You can all have, we cannot type of the, the, the statemanship and leadership. You know, leaders are the people who are ready to, to put their life at stake to do things and to risk their own skin to do things. So personal leadership would be as important as the, the, the 
general reform and uh, the technocratic transformation. Thank you. Так, українське це робити, але це було технічно дуже складно, бо всі б бігли і нема достатньо цих. I was thinking of giving this presentation in the local language, uh, but uh, I think it's uh, technically will become impossible because ears, the ears for those who are English speakers won't work. So let me do it in English. And would you mind getting my uh, have a Okay, uh, 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 in the general context of we need to communicate well, uh, Maria Sidorovic and I, Dr. Maria Sidorovic sitting here, namely uh, how to deal with the continuing fear of rapid reforms, the shock therapy uh, business. Uh, for those who, who you who want the Ukrainian version, this has been published as an article in для тих, що хочуть по українськи, це в економічна правда першого квітня видрукована як стаття. All right, next slide, please. The basic. Ah, ah, ta, ta, ta. Zaraz, zaraz. No, that's easier. Так. Okay. Here's the basic syllogism or logic. Back in the early 90s, populations in all of the uh, transition economies, most politicians and many experts uh, feared rapid reforms would cause a great deal of social pain. And uh, that was one of the reasons, not the only, there were the theoretical uh, reasons why uh, some advocated a more gradual approach. The, anybody who pushed for quick uh, reforms uh, was often criticized for being a uh, unrealistic and, and romantic. Well, unfortunately for economists, in, in 1989, 1991, it was impossible to test the hypothesis that rapid reforms cause great pain. There was just no prior experience, right? Empirical tests were impossible then. So it had to go on, uh, on faith. However, we're 25 years down the road. Guess what? There's a lot of statistics. And we can, in fact, apply such a uh, very simple test of what the relationship was speed of reforms and the social pain on Ukraine, uh, but they are actually quite representative, each of them, uh, of what happened and what happened in the FSU. All right. Let's uh, be quantitative about it. First of all, look at the curves or lines, blue and red, uh, which is to say Poland and Ukraine. Those are, uh, show the evolution over time of the progress towards the market, and they're based on the well-known transition progress index of the EBRD. Well, we see Ukraine uh, was was very far behind at the beginning and started moving quite late. Uh, the fact that it moved late, I think, is an important phenomenon, but I won't I think if you want to seek explanations of oligarch development, that's an important uh, determinant factor in your equation the itself. Anyway, it's pretty clear that Ukraine was a slow reformer, Poland was a quick reformer. Central Europe represented by Poland and uh, uh, FSU by, uh, by Ukraine. All right, 25 years later, who did better? How do we measure doing better in economics? Well, the very first number we do use to measure better is per capita GDP. And those are the bars, horizontal bars, histograms, in, uh, in the with again uh, Poland blue and Ukraine red. Well, not only did Poland start recovering from the economic transition uh, quite early compared to Ukraine, Ukraine's recession, transition re recession continued for 10 years or so, but even, uh, even more so by the time we get to about 2012, 2013, 
the difference in per capita incomes as per the uh, World Bank estimates is huge. Actually, this is a very well known the Maidan. How many times the Maidanci knew that then Ukraine, starting off at about the same place in terms of standards of living, came apart like so. By 2012, 2013, Poland's GDP per capita was three, four times that of Ukraine. Well, but uh, GDP per capita is often criticized by non-economists as not really capturing everything. Fine. What does capture everything? There has been a different index of social well-being, a much more direct measure of social well-being, called the Human Development Index, uh, put together annually by the UNDP in New York. What happened to the Human Development Index? That's the real acid test of social pains. Well, uh, in Poland and Ukraine, uh, uh, but also uh, the broad groups, Central Europe, Baltics, FSU 9. Uh, and we see here that the same story holds as for GDP per capita. The rapid reformers much less deterioration of social conditions than did the slow reformers. Which is to say, uh, the basic thesis that shock therapy causes greater social pain than slow reforms seems to be belied by the actual statistics of 25 years. The actual statistics of 25 years seem to show exactly the contrary. And contrary to expectation, the uh, rapid reformers believe amount of social pain was caused. I emphasize least because I'm not for a moment suggesting that the transition process, that the reform process, that's not the relevant point to communicate by the, today's reformist government. The current government, in order to address the fears in the public, and those fears in the public are concentrated uh, largely in the demographic of 35 plus, uh, I don't think there are great fears amongst the, the uh, for Maidanci and uh, for Maidan activists of, of reforms. In fact, to the contrary, they want to see them as fast as possible. To address the fears of those governments, here's a little suggestion for a small uh, little bit of information. Tell the public what happened in Central Europe over the past 25 years. And the basic message is, is, of course, we're not. Much less pain, because we'll see repetition of history. We're much less pain by doing reforms quickly than we would have by doing them slowly. Thank you. Where do I start? So hello to everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm Ina Sofson, I'm first Deputy Minister of Education and Science. So I will, um, will not be from the perspective of someone who has been to, to the government for well, and um, um, I'll try to convey the ideas that uh, uh, I had for the, for the last year while trying to reform the, the field of education. Um, I think I will, I will start by saying is that uh, to keep the popular support for reforms, the step one is actually doing the reforms. And I think a lot of people forget about that because for, for, for the last year I've, I've heard a lot of people talking about reforms, but I'm not always sure that we are actually sure what we are talking about. I'm not sure if we are going to deregulate the economy or if are we going to lower taxes or are we going to increase the public expenditures? Those are 
different things. And people who argue for reforms, those who want the reforms, they might often say things that are actually contradictory in itself. So I think that the, the number one problem is that there is no clear vision that is shared by absolutely everyone, both in the government, in the parliament, in the president's office, of what reforms we're actually doing. And I think that things which sound popular, just because we want the reforms to be popular, but we are missing the point that many things can sound right, but they will not work out if we do them all together. You cannot decrease taxes and increase public expenditure. I mean, in some cases, but there are a lot of economists who can argue much better than I do about that. But I'm sure that there are things that are contradictory, and we cannot keep popular reforms and, and uh, make the reforms the, the victim of this popularity. Reforms will not always be popular, and this is the, the, the step one. We have to recognize that they will not always be popular, and we should, shouldn't f fight for popularity of the reforms, but we should fight for the reforms themselves. Um, so I think that reforms uh, and having a clear and coherent vision of the reforms is step number one. And, and platforms like this and, and many others is where this vision is being developed. And I think this is a big step forward compared to what we had a year ago when there was no clear understanding. And uh, at some point of time, I've, I've, uh, when everybody was just talking about the reforms, I started questioning myself, what reforms do you want? What reforms are we talking about? It felt like the reform itself became just an empty word that means that that we want everything better than it used to be, but we're not sure how to get there. So I think for professional, for, 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 for responsible political leadership, it's really important to have a coherent vision and to say what exactly we, where exactly we are going and how we're going to get there and who's going to be winners and losers in this. So I think that is an important thing. And that is not what we are always very successful with. And, and I'm happy to hear from, from uh, our colleagues here that uh, there is some movement in terms of reforms. But uh, <clears throat> I think we could, we could do better if we had a more clear and consistent vision of what we are doing. Not just saying that we are fighting for the better. I mean, everybody is, but there are different understandings of what better future is. Uh, have populism, not popular reforms. And that is what is often happening now in the parliament, I mean, in the, in the government as well, everywhere. When some steps are being taken, but then there is uh, a different understanding, and, and uh, now the parliament is passing different legislation than it was passing a few months ago when the budget was being uh, passed by the parliament. And now a lot of people in the parliament would say that we did the wrong thing when we passed the, the, the budget that we did. And, and I think this is a very wrong thing to do. We, we, when you have a vision and you have an understanding of what you're doing, you should stick to it, people, what you're doing, instead of just reversing what you have done before. Um, so uh, th that is the most important part. But uh, when you have a vision, when you have an understanding, it still doesn't mean that, that everything will go smoothly. When now, um, our team came to the Ministry of Education and Science in March 2014, just a few weeks after after the shutdown, and after everything was so unclear, we actually were pretty lucky before because um, we had at least a formulated vision of what we want to do with with higher education. Because for five years before that, the new law on higher education was being debated, and there was. Um, more or less a consensus of what we need to do, where we need to get, and, and uh, what we need to reach. So we had the new law on higher education passed in, in June 2015. First big reform uh, law that was passed by the parliament. Uh, so that seems pretty easy. We have the law, we have the ideas. The, the ideas have been debated uh, in, in, a, in a rather big uh, uh, circles of people. Does that make the, the, the implementation of the reform easy? No, it doesn't. It is still very difficult, it is still very painful, and it is still very annoyingly inefficient. Not because we are not trying to hurt, but because it costs too much for people who are suffering because of the reforms. We are now seeing a lot of uh, um, criticism of what we are doing just because those things are not popular, and arguing that this is the, the way they do it in Europe, that they, this is the way they do it in the States, is actually not working as much as I wish it worked. So uh, it, it doesn't mean 
that we, we, we couldn't do our job better. I, I believe we all could do our job better. Full process, and it does require um, a very distinct communication policy and very distinct communication plan. And I have to admit, we, we don't have a pretty good communication plan. I have two people for, for the for the PR service in the Ministry of Education and Science, and they are overwhelmed with with too much work that they need to do. So we don't have anybody else doing the communication policy. And uh, even though me, the minister, other deputy ministers, several other people from, from the ministries are doing really hard work in communicating to the public, it's still not easy. It still needs to fit into the general government plan of the reforms. And, and I think uh, that now is really a time to pay more attention to communicating the reforms and to find different ways of communicating the reforms. Things uh, is how to make communication of the reforms easier is to find different people who will speak for you. It's not just me, First Deputy Minister of Education, saying that this reform package for higher education who are saying that this package is good. Students, uh, teachers, um, university rectors, Sometimes they usually will, will, they will say it's bad, but but we can find some who will say it's good. Find the speakers who will be defending the position that you are developing, that you are trying to implement, and I think that is really really important. Uh, another tip is some minor change that will much money now for for you here. I might argue, but we we can do some things that. Uh, are very small, they don't require money, but that will make things easier for people involved. Uh, like like easing uh, uh, the, the, the bureaucratic processes in the universities, and that is something that we have been doing pretty successfully recently. So so uh, those are small things, and when people see that, they, they, they do feel at least some sympathy for our efforts. So I think that is also important, is, is, you, is you just sell them some minor changes, but that are, will be visible to them, and that will make uh, uh, the, the transition process easier for them. Uh, tip number three is, is don't try to trust Facebook. That is uh, something that, that people tend to do, particularly people who are sitting here in these rooms, people who are going to conferences like this. Uh, we live in social networks, uh, but our constituencies don't. Uh, our teachers in schools don't use social networks. Our stu uh, students, that is a different story. But, 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 uh, but most people that, that uh, we need to communicate reforms to, they don't use social networks as much as we all do. So I don't think we should trust Facebook in terms of measuring our popularity of the reforms. But we should use it as a, as a means of communicating. Let it, uh, getting the information of, of what is the problem at the moment, um, so, so to be right, right usage of, of, of these instruments. And some of the previous speakers have told about that is civil society. Civil society, we do have a strong civil society in Ukraine. We do have people in the civil society who do have great ideas, who, have, who do a great job with, with developing those ideas and developing the reform plans. But only a few percent of people are actually members of the civil society organizations in Ukraine. So while those organizations are rather strong, again, they are not very representative for, for the country in general. So again, we should be really careful when, when, when listening to them. I mean, we should listen to civil... I used to run a civil society organization prior to coming to work to the ministry. But again, we, sh we should realize how representative their idea are for the society in general. And, and, and uh, my tip number five... Uh, uh, well, it's last but not least, and in it, uh, it clearly shows that I don't come from political background. Uh, my last tip is tell the truth. And, and uh, I think that is also very important. Uh, you sh shouldn't be lying on TV, you should just tell the truth. That's it for me. Right. Um. It's hard to say something new when you join the speakers like this and uh, in an hour 
you have to make the presentation on the same subject. Uh, I'll be restructuring a little bit uh, so that I don't say the same. I want to acknowledge uh, the sponsors and the organizers, in particular the Vox Ukraine, uh, a startup, intellectual startup like this that uh, moved into this space and now to see their name with the intellectual giants on the board is, uh, is big. I, I'm very thankful to you. It's great that you guys exist and I'm very proud to be associated, uh, associated with you. I um, um, joined the government very recently. I um, lived outside of the country for 25 years. I came here, other than the language, everything is pretty, pretty new. Um, the work in most of my life in uh, the technology business, where things are fast, where uh, things are digital, where everything moves very, very fast. Um, the government is the absolute opposite, and, um, and that's what makes the transition somewhat hard. Um, we, for is, is escape from the Soviet Union. I believe what we have inherited from the Soviet Union is a welfare state. And, um, and we still live with that welfare state, except that it was already not doing very well. Um, I thought at the time it was bankrupted, but uh, through 20 plus years, we managed to keep the welfare. We managed to uh, bring in some serious corruption and oligarchy, and all together we have the monster that needs needs to be uh, seriously dissembled. And uh, um, this premature welfare state problem, it's a problem for the economy, it's a problem for uh, psychology of the nation, of individuals involved. Someone was, I will not be bringing much numbers because they were already used, but let's say our pensions are, uh, they're running at 18% of the GDP, and uh, in Europe it's usually 8%. Uh, so imagine if you start dissembling this uh, welfare, premature welfare, you actually have to cut into it. Um, it's important to reform and uh, uh, Ivan Miklos probably can say more about that. It's important to reform that hurts to reform that actually benefits. And I believe in Slovakia what they've done is they, they, took, they took an unpopular reform and they connected it to the pension reform to, to, make, it, to make it beneficial. I hope I'm getting this right. And um, so if you look at... If you look at the, if you look at the vision, and I'm not saying that this is our vision. This is something that's been picked up from uh, different reform plans of different governments in the region. Uh, you can pretty much see that um, a lot of this would not be popular with the nation, and the question is, how? Do this to people? How do you say that, look, we're going to run something unpopular like this, and then uh, we'll cut the pen. We have 8% subsidies, 8% uh, from GDP, which are subsidies, and you need to cut those as well. Something like uh, 35 uh, state companies that need to be reorganized, which probably would affect people's lives. Uh, we have 40 plus national projects which mainly need to be dissembled, which again will affect people's life. How do you, how do you communicate all of this? And, and, and other unpopular things. I recently was at the land reform discussion and I understood that it's an extremely political issue. The people discuss it, people are ready to fight. And, and this is where you have to you see, I, I came to the government as a, what is called a technopole, a technopole that um, assumed political responsibility, if you will. And our entire ministry is like this. There are several ministries like this that people came, they are not associated, affiliated with any political 
It's hard for us because we stepped in, there was already a coalition agreement in place. And the coalition agreement is anything but it doesn't dissemble the welfare state. If anything, it promotes the welfare state. So as a technopole coming to the government, what do you do? And my, and I believe that's position of everyone in our ministry is that we have to be intellectually honest. We are brought into this to say, look, as a doctor who came to the patient who has a cancer, it would be intellectually dishonest for us to say that we need to fix your nose running first. I believe we came and we need to say the truth and we need to see what is the best therapy. And to, to heal cancer, therapy is aggressive. Most of the time it is aggressive. Oftentimes it doesn't work, but you have to take the risk. And, and you have to, t to do that. And again, as I was walking into the room, Ivan Miklos told me that the risky, th the, the risky plan is better than the hopeless one. And so the technopoles in the new government have to take as our strategy to, uh, to uh, bring to people. Um, the I would, I would say that there is a mood in the society for reforms. There is a, there is, people want to see them, and I believe that if we play it smart, we actually can sell it to get the nation excited. Give people a roadmap and say, look, this is the graph. This is how we are falling right now. This is where the U-turn or V-turn will be, and this is why it will be there. And we need to show on this, ra on this, on this map how, the, how the, any particular reform will affect and will impact the road that we're in. And we also need to go to the politicians, to the um, RADA members, first of all, and say, look, this is the plan that we have, and this is how we want to get you there, and this is what it will mean in terms of time and in terms of the impact on the population. And then we all together, we need to build a political, very broad political front. Uh, we can bring this message to the society and say that, look, there is simply no other way. And if we bring I believe if we take good messages, if we, t if we minimize the number of them, if we bring the right people into the mix, people who ac actually know how to do things, professionals, I believe it's a good chance to excite people and say, look, uh, we know what we are doing. There is a plan, and this is the plan. It's fairly simple. It's been tried, and it works. And so, like, like this, we have to take this path and we'll get through and we'll be done. So that's my, uh, at risk of repeating something I will cut. Uh, so this is my message to, to you. I, I want to, we acknowledge already the audience, I want to acknowledge people who are watching this online. Uh, you guys are very smart. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, we need more. Uh, we need more digital in this digital as well. Uh, so thank you, and you go next. Sorry, I I, uh, I didn't prepare the presentation. <clears throat> I am Yevgen Bestritsky, I represent uh, the International Renaissance Foundation. It happened so for last at least year. I occupy uh, two seats. First of all, I the foundation. Uh, does support to the civil society organizations. We are the biggest donor in Ukraine, uh, who, which, or, you know, the support civil society movements, initiatives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, from other side, due to George Soros initiative, and uh, together with our colleagues from EBRD, the Eric is here. This we uh, uh, organized advisory uh, groups to the ministries, to the key ministers. And uh, such groups consist from the local experts uh, who um, produce policies and drafts of legislative acts uh, on reforms. So because of that, I would like to share with you my uh, judgments or just my judgment or the diagnosis 
or where we are with reforms. I am not now from the midst of the civil society, but I am involved in civil society, understanding and the experiencing reforms, where we are with that. Just now, one, uh, one hour ago, I had a presentation at the other, another conference. Other conference, uh, the conference with the title Ukraine on Crossroads, uh, New Politics and the Civil Society. And, and after our presentations, it was panel with the head of the, uh, uh, the NET of the Ukraine Endowment. Uh, uh, this representatives of all the participants of the conference raised a question. One question was directed direct to me. So we are talking about the reforms, about the role of the experts, etc., etc. But you know, it was voice society. This is the Poroshenko is oligarch. To change it, you know this. It is impossible to have a president as a colleague. He should fight with Ukraine. It was one voice, and the, uh, people applauded him. It is one uh, uh, intention, one of intentions of the civil society. From other side, we have the experts of them uh, are sitting here among you, and uh, you know this day. They uh, provide uh, expertise, exp expertise to, to the ministers, uh, in addition to the internal top experts who do the same. So because of that, I would like to uh, pay your attention at least to next uh, uh, the characteristics of the where well, we are with the uh, civil society support for reforms. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that we have indeed very motivated civil society organizations and movements and initi initiatives to which uh, volunteer movement added a very serious um, dimension. Together with civil society, the historical uh, strong, well-established civil society organizations, volunteer movement uh, 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 understood, they together understood that the uh, at all levels are not effective in Ukraine. And the uh, attitude uh, of civil society organizations cases is most cases is very critical to the government. Uh, why? First of all, uh, I was in Mariupol a couple of weeks ago, and in Severodonetsk, there are local people do not feel that or the government uh, really uh, 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 the government people are, are doing reforms. Um, first of all, it is because uh, indeed existing huge inertia of governmental institutions, and the such institutions and the uh, uh, institutions like uh, education, like public health, like pension uh, institutions or, or pension state in, in the country, that has uh, that have a huge inertia. It is impossible to immediately, but at the same time, first observation I would like to share with you is that we, uh, don't, we are failing with civil reform. This is number one issue. For point of view, experience I, I gained from my communication with the ministries and the, uh, the government people. What, the, what I mean, the first task, you know, one of the first tasks, one of the first challenges for the government is to provide uh, reform of ministries, change their functions. One of functions that we need to provide reforms is the uh, uh, creating policies or 
you know, to elaborate public policies of reform, or that dialogue with the society, with the population, in which we need it, extremely need it. It happened expert structures of government institutions was and is quite low. Because the advisory groups, we involved local experts uh, who uh, communicate with uh, their international colleagues, top experts from other countries. Many donors uh, support this work. Uh, um, this is a function that had to be and has to be change it right now, change it to ch changing function. This one, this is number one issue. It uh, uh, relates to the, uh, you know, the, to the um, uh, uh, civil servants reform at the level at least ministries. And as far as, know, uh, as, far as I know, the uh, Ivaras Abramovich, is, it is one of his idea to change functions, and it means the, the, uh, the second is indeed strategic communication or communicating reforms. Just simple example, I increasing tariffs. What had to be done? Government had, together with the, the Ministry of Social uh, Policy, they had to just to seem in very explain people, bring to people how it has to be done, what stages of it. Was it done? No. Why? Because PR departments in our ministries and the cabinet are completely the same as it was in first years of independence. But we provided funds, we, we funded uh, the uh, Ukrainian Media Crisis Center. Ukrainian Media, Media Crisis Center, it is a group of uh, independent journalists that created, in fact, uh, new information agencies in Ukraine. And we uh, funded it quite substantially and proposed capacities and efforts from one side journalists, leading journalists, and from our side experts who work in our uh, 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 advisory groups, and to produce visions of reforms next year on the first stage of reform, the second, etc., etc., in each areas, in each direction of tracks of reforms. Uh, from my experience, it was, it has not been done. Why? Because we have not experienced journalists or experts. And because they, there is a lack of capacities to be not populistic, not uh, highlight scandals, you know, political, political uh, uh, tensions, but first of all, to provide audience with Understanding where we are with the, this or that reform, for instance, education reform in a uh, uh, nose. This the same. It is very difficult to explain uh, massive education community. What does it mean autonomy of university? Believe me, right now I, I visited a couple of universities last last weeks, and the, in one case we met feudalism when the rector is the very autonomous. And from other side, we have the anarchies, the university community states that we are, you know, we know what we should do. Like, you know, this, uh, like uh, the, the representative of civil society who said that, you know, this overnight we will do what reforms, you know. So, and finally, <clears throat> um, uh, what should be done? What should be done? Uh, in addition to what I, I stated in terms of the uh, civil servants reform, I do not want to mention uh, 
the uh, fighting corrupt, combating corruption, you know, human, uh, human rights and the rule of law, establishing rule of law. I want to say that, first of all, uh, there is no real consolidated political will or political understanding just in the country in which way, what stages of reform should be done. But I, National Reform Council, which uh, launched its work last December, now increased its capacity to, to uh, work out at least pri priorities of reforms. This is an independent platform, very useful for nation and reconciling various the states. But at the same time, the cabinet, uh, I should not, I don't generalize it, but mainly uh, institutions of the cabinet of the minister, of the minister, ministries, they uh, uh, have not skills, capacities, and real instruments to communicate with society or with expert organizations. It is fact. It is fact. Uh, it is not enough to rely upon only uh, experienced people uh, from these think tanks, analytical centers. It's not enough because civil society in Ukraine is very difficult to consist from very, very various, uh, uh, on various, various views on the future of Ukraine and the current state of us. And because of the, such openness, uh, insistently developed dialogue with all potential groups of civil society is a number of this. Well, yeah. Thank you very much. I think what we could do now is uh, perhaps uh, we, we have a bit of time is have the panel maybe engage each other if they see the need for that because they there were some differing points of views. And since uh, they don't want to do that, uh, and apparently, uh, then we'll just switch to you. Uh, a lot, uh, and perhaps you can start by asking questions. I'd like to just raise one more point because we've created a mix of different issues, and that is reform and, uh, and communication leadership of reforms. This is an issue which our colleagues uh, from Slovakia raised with us, and whenever we uh, we know that reforms are always accompanied by a leader of reforms who was always in your face, as they say in, a, in the United States. Ronald Reagan's reforms, and Ronald Reagan was the great communicator, and he was communicating them to the public and gaining public. Uh, 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 Margaret Thatcher certainly is a great example of that. Uh, Roosevelt, who started with his fireside chats and so on. Um, and, and perhaps we're not, since we're talking about support for to throw that in to our mix of discussion who will be the spokesman for reforms who is the driver of reforms who is in the face of vacuum darks and corrupt individuals and so on suddenly become the heroes of the country so let, let with all of that in mind then perhaps we can start with questions we have a microphone that's circulating and we have our first question thank you ah the, uh, the 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 leader will be the person who will assume political responsibility. Whomever will be able to say this is not going to exit to exit. Um, if you look at the history, most of the, the reformers had to exit, with the exception probably Klaus, who was an excellent communicator and built a fantastic career, a political career in the Czech Republic. But whomever in Ukraine will be ready to say, look, this is a set of bad messages. I'm coming here, I'll be, I'm, I'll be intellectually honest with you, I'll tell you what we're gonna do, and I'm assuming full political responsibility for 
for that. And that person will be the speaker. I don't, I don't have the name for you. Uh, I, I don't know if you got excited, but... Uh, Thank you very much. But that raises another point too, and that is bad message. You know, the communication to the people should be, you guys are gonna suffer, you're gonna go through hell, et cetera, et cetera. So grit your teeth, uh, because that's and in the end, it'll be good for you. You'll recover from cancer, but you'll be uh, an invalid for a while. Or, or, is the, or is the message that we want to say, uh, is it a bright one? It says, look at these other countries. Look at where you could be. Look, be screwed up along the way. We're finally straightening it out. You're going to be there. In six months, we're going to have this. In one year, this. In two years, that. Three years, and so forth. Because there's no message. Nobody knows which reform benefits, etc. Nothing. Uh, so, yes, you're right. Somebody who's, and that person won't be a comic. That, that person will be elected and reelected and reelected, even if he takes responsibility and says, moments will be tough because the end is great. I'm sorry. Is it on? Okay. But, um, well, I, I think we are that I have available with the resources, with the very limited resources that we, we do have. And, uh, um, but of course, we, we use uh, the, the mass media, that is the, the, the platform number one. And the problem, of course, is that our mass media, and that is something that I, I don't think has been <coughs> emphasized enough within this discussion, is that our media in talking about the reforms uh, professionally. So when, when journalists come up to me and ask some question about education reform, and you realize that this is just, they, they just want a um, few sentences from me, make a report, and then, and then go proceed to another topic. So they're not really professional with what they're saying. And I think that, that the problem with, of the mass media in terms of communicating the reforms is, is a very, very big one. So I do think this is, this is a problem that, that we should also discuss and, and how to make our media professional, how to force them to, to talk professional about reforms. Um, but um, I mean, it is very tempting to, to use uh, social media like Facebook, and I do use Facebook, and I do use other the, the media, but I don't think that this uh, is doing uh, I mean, this is not doing all of it. Uh, you still need to use the TV channels. You still need to use the popular newspapers. I might not allow the public to hear what I have to say. I have to, I have to use it to discuss the education reform with those uh, mass media which are indeed popular. So, um, and then uh, come into different venues like this, uh, but this is again a very specific community. But but going to to the uh, well in my case to universities because I'm responsible for higher education. So going to universities is something that is also very important. Uh, you go to people that you are directly involved with, and I think that is doing a, a good job. Uh, well, I think that, that that feels very fruitful. It 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 gives you a chance to communicate what you are doing, and it's also and and um, I. I Every time I go to any university, I think I freak out the rectors because I always ask them, arrange me a meeting with the students, but no, no professors present. And then they, 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 they go crazy about that, but they have to do that because the ministry says so. But I think this is important to do so. But so, so you talk to, to, to people that, that you are directly working with and, and uh, you feel their response. I mean, a few months ago, I had to communicate the need for, for the reform of, of the uh, student support system. And, and my mom called me and said, I'm crazy. She said, like, you shouldn't be talking about that because that is a very unpopular topic. But I still went there. I went to the student uh, representatives meetings and so on and so forth just to start the discussion about the need for, for change of the student support model. So I think going to people directly is also very important and not relying fully on, on social media. That, that is a very tempting and easy way to do that. Thank you. Um, there was recently an article in Vox Ukraine on how different ministries are using uh, Twitter. 
And it was interesting for me as well to see that some are advanced in that communication, some were not that advanced. Uh, I want to think that our ministry is pretty advanced. Uh, we have a very progressive minister, as you know. He's considered to be one of the uh, biggest promoters. So he built the team pretty much along the same lines. And um, we all are technology savvy. Uh, we go for pretty much every, every uh, mean of communicating with the elite, with people that is out there. Now, what our message is going to be, I suppose our message would be that, look, we have a team. We, this team has developed a strategy. We want you to believe that the strategy is good. We want you to believe that we have a plan that supports that strategy. And we are here, we are honest, educated, and we'll get you there and you guys have to believe us that we can do it and so that's how we want to approach this whole exercise I hope this answers your question uh, Olga Kupica from National University of Kiev associate professor of the uh, economics department my question is to Ina Sassoon uh, 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 I know that you are ready for unpopular reforms, uh, but are you ready uh, to tell uh, people uh, uh, about reduction of enrollment to tertiary education, about uh, integration of science uh, and education, particularly uh, uh, what about uh, the Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences? Uh, of uh, uh, teachers, uh, professors, uh, these obsolete skills and so on, and how to communicate this uh, so that these reforms are supported at all levels. Thank you. Um, well, uh, uh, we are communicating about that as much as possible, and, and uh, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. A few months ago, we have developed uh, 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 a new regulation about instruction about uh, uh, the new criteria for uh, people who want to get the professorship title. Um, I don't know how many of those of you involved in academia in that way or another probably have heard about that because it, it caused a, a huge debate. Uh, because one of the things that we said that you need to have is a, a proof of, of, of uh, um, uh, a proof that you speak foreign language on B2 level, which is uh, upper intermediate. Uh, and and uh, people went crazy about that. They said, uh, are these the reforms we were fighting for? Why, why not? I mean, you don't want our prof professors to speak English? I mean, everybody does, but not the professors, of course. Uh, so uh, that was one of the things that, and, and it's still an ongoing debate, and, and we said you have to publish international peer review journals, that is again one of the new criteria that we're introducing, that again doesn't get us a lot of a lot of popularity among the professors, uh, but I do think it will uh, probably be good for education in five years term. So, so we, we are talking about things that are unpopular among our, our constituency in terms of education and academia. Uh, we are talking about uh, we have another hot topic that we are debate, uh, discussing now is we have too many schools, both in, in higher education but also in secondary education. We have too many schools. The demographics is not allowing us to have so many schools. And I've been talking for that for, for a year in all media possible. Again, that doesn't make us popular, but that is one of the things that we need to do is we need to discuss the consolidation of the schools. And, and that is something that is becoming part of the, of the political agenda at the moment as well. So, so we are communicating that. It, it does, uh, and, and people are, so, so even those people, reforms, we want a lot of things, okay, people want reforms, but they don't want anything to change. That, that is the, the, the general understanding for, for themselves, yes. They want higher salaries, but they don't, don't want to work higher for, for those higher salaries. And you, you really just, uh, yeah, you just need to tell them the truth um, again. Uh, if uh, uh, sorry to intervene here, but 
a general point that I'm a little worried about, um, even more so uh, with this discussion. Uh, yes, as an economist, I uh, agree fully with the uh, principles laid out uh, so nicely by Girard that uh, you, you need to worry about compensating losers. Hang on a second. Losers in what sense? Do we really think of those parts of society, individuals in society, who have a distorted system as losers? Well, we can't forget about them altogether, but if we spend too much attention to each squeaky wheel, we will never get that bloody wagon moving forward. Right, we have a next question lined up. Yes, right there. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, the, you know, thank you very much for for your like, uh, pointing attention to the f over Facebooking of some challenges. But on the other hand, uh, uh, Sydney Metro raised 100 million views for their for their for for their dumb ways to die safety job. Teaching kids to be safe around train and underestimate creative ways. But the question actually is is the following and who has the answer for this question. Sometimes we are speaking about communicating the reforms and forgetting about communication. Could could you just tell me the name of the person responsible in the in the Ukrainian administration for our president and our PM not addressing directly, not just Ukrainians waiting for Ukrainians being on the occupied territories and on the territories. First time we heard from the president somebody addressing the people who are under Russian aggression now. It was during his New Year's uh, and during his New New, New Year's address words in Crimea, Crimean Tatar. And the same, we don't have at the moment the regular, so we have the Minister of the Information, and who is in charge to make the Minister of Information work and to communicate with citizens, both who are under Ukrainian government and who are under, under Russian rules to speak directly and like Churchill did or like Roosevelt did about the everyday challenges, because they are they are cut out, and when we are cutting out our citizens, well, we are leaving somebody in the hot, cold water. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for your question. Uh, it happens so that I am not from government, you know, these people. I am, I am from, I don't know, this donor, donor institution in the civil society, but it happened so that last at least four months, I had uh, numerous meetings with the uh, states, new minister of information. And I would like to say first, in terms of the responsibility for uh, communicating reforms or communicating on uh, states' uh, approaches to various things from the administration now is uh, not Oleg Medvedev, but Natasha Popovich. Natasha Popovich, she is the leader of Ukrainian uh, uh, media crisis center and she works now for the administration of the president and advice and, and provide advices how to communicate in terms of the various things including reforms the first the second who is responsible the, as a representative of the national reform council but i would like to touch the issue uh, of, on, of uh, info uh, the ministry of information uh, the um, community of media experts in Ukraine from the very beginning uh, was against this ministry because all of them stated and some of them state now that the ministry is uh, aimed to provide some elements of Censorship. This one issue. The second issue side, uh, Donetsk, Lugansk, with Crimea, populations so of the people there, plus to communicate with the international audiences. This uh, provide them with the what uh, 
formal of officials of the state thinks about reforms, about the situation in, in Ukraine, it really needs to be done through the some uh, some some consolidated uh, consolidated instruments of the broadcasting from the side of the government. It is absolutely clear that it should be uh, stated as such. At the same time, what we have in Ukraine right now, uh, Ukraine, they organized the uh, public broadcasting, public TV, in fact. And through public TV, it, it could be done through public TV, but it takes time to develop it. Uh, and in addition to the uh, TV channels, you know, respond, you, you, you have maybe response to that. So this is where, where we are. This is conflict, this is tension, this is discussions, but at the same time, we have not moved just for centimeter from the, uh, you know, this, the, the situation where we are. Uh, pa pa I'd like to add to that. Uh, you need to understand how the government functions right now. Um, we're all new people, and we are effectively uh, volunteers. Uh, I, I've been with the government for the last, I haven't been paid one single hrivnia yet, and my entire team is the same way. And, and uh, uh, so it's all run by people who Right. I'm happy it felt that way and not this way. <laughs> I, it, I consider it good luck. Okay. Anyway, so so you see, um, we run we run to such extent by, by volunteers, and and I'll give you the same speech that I give each time when I hear when someone gets up and says, "Look, something something doesn't work," and 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 I say usually, "Yes, we do know that things don't work very, very well." and we make mistakes. What you can do is, all right, you identify the issue, we agree that's an issue. Then think about it, make a concept, develop that into a come over, we sit together, I'll give you my salary for that day. You develop that as whatever that is, communication plan or whatever, whatever issue you spot it. We, we have a chance to have a popular government where the government is powered by people, right? And, and so whatever, guys, you notice here that there is an issue, something needs to be fixed. Don't say, hey, you government, come and fix it for us because we see this is a problem. What you should do is call, call us and say, I'd like to participate in fixing this one thing. Okay. Was my turn. Um, uh, uh, this was actually a very good example that I would like to refer to. Uh, reform. Uh, I agree with most of the things that the speaker said, uh, but communicating is easier when the reformer is prepared to share the hardship of the reform with the rest of the population. Now, I'm thinking, I'm corporate governance advisor to the CEO of Nafta Gas. Sorry? Speak up, okay. One of the things that need to be reformed in state-owned enterprises is adequate compensation for the management to attract the right people to lead those companies. I'm not sure that the populace is going to receive that message as sharing hardship with them. So I was wondering, I'm mostly looking at Professor Roland and uh, uh, Bailoff, uh, how would you go about communicating that message? It's even worse than hardship. It's hardship plus some other people will be seen as uh, benefiting from the reform at the background of hardship. Yeah. I'd just like to remind you again when uh was asked that question on uh, Schuster Live, and how much do you earn? And you know, he cited how much he earned, and you could see the negative sentiment against him immediately. There's this kind of a 
populism that's starting to spread that everybody, it's like communism. Everybody should be poor. And then everything is fine. That's a reform. Everybody becomes, you know, and then we're, we're all equal. And nobody's richer than us because you don't like, we, we, we're more bad than direction, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and that is considered a lot of money. <laughs> so, so you know, uh, I'm not going to say how much it should exactly be, but, but uh, uh, you know, one thing it is that you have fictitious salaries in many places, and then people live from corruption and bribes, and and there's a huge hypocrisy about this, and, and I think one just has to hide hypocrisy is, is, and, and it's just all over. So, so. so Way, if if people start complaining about you know some high official or the the head of the anti-corruption bureau getting a salary that they thought about the corruption that that so many other people receive who are in the pockets of the oligarchs, I mean that's that's very important. You know, one should not be afraid of fighting for the for the right principles and and transparency is important there. Have to put. Things in context. Sure, there are many reforms that are going to, but this is a fight for a country, for its freedom, for its democracy, law, for for for, for, for you know equal treatment before justice. There's there's a whole, whole there's a whole plan. Everything has to be seen within that context, and the populists are able to fight by by sort of you know very superficial attacks against something. But there has to be much more for forcefulness against the enemies of democracy, against against these populists who who are using confusion uh, uh, in people's minds. I, I think you know, it's not just the quantity of communication; is is that you have to be aggressive against the enemies of democracy. No, I, I just uh, I think what what add a, a few words. I think what is absolutely critical is. To you need to be transparent about this, but you also need what has been achieved. I think NAFTA gas is a very good example. I mean, the reforms, you know, the the kind of uh, changes that have been brought about. What has happened to to uh, uh, Ukraine's uh, dependence on on gas directly from Russia is truly remarkable. I think that's a lesson that I've learned, at least, is that when you are Explaining raises of tariffs or, or uh, you know, uh, of water or electricity. If you can show that the water is actually drinkable now, or that you know the power is actually being delivered, I think that's you need to tell the whole picture. You, you know, need to provide the narrative, and that we are trying to get the best people to work in the government. And and you know, the National Reform Council is trying. A lot of money has been raised to try to give them a chance to, to uh, recruit people on the market. Not everyone can you know, do as, as actually many of the ministers now are working for free. And, you know, and, and they have tons of volunteers working for nothing. That's not just that needs to be addressed and that should be open uh, uh, discussion about that. Fight for freedom, democracy, but you didn't say the key word. I was listening here, and none of you used the word capitalism. And this is what we're fighting for. We're fighting to build a capitalist society here. But if you tell the population that we're building a capitalist society, they will throw the water here. Because basically, the population has learned in the last 23 years board. It creates oligarchs, it creates rich people. People here inherently disrespect capital because they know that all there is no honest capital in the country. And the laws are built in dollars. That money, you have to avoid taxes. You right? And basically, until we stop making capital a dirty word, I don't think the reforms are going to be successful. Uh, does that, is there a microphone floating out there? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Rotary Clubs Association. Uh, 
across Lukacs and I would reflect and support to what Sasha Borovic and Yevgen uh, Bistritsky said that um, we have a very big speciality here in Ukraine after Maidan during this uh, year, maybe a year and a half. Uh, we see that our top, top bananas, top managers of the country, they are not leaders. So somebody said it's uh, good, it's bad, but it gives a very good floor for for these young people, and also plus, uh, plus democratization, plus e-democracy, electronic democracy. It gives very good floor for these people to have their chance and to change this, uh, how to say, ministry's machine, to give it uh, it very old place, become a new, is new. Is this a speech or is this a question? Yeah, it's a question. It's a long question. Gerard. Oh, we're question for, for Gerard, because question. yesterday he he, to, he tell uh, he told us about these new tips for reforms. Yeah. So what so would you comment? Is, Thank you, Gerard. I didn't, get the question. I didn't exactly get the question. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to remind you that, you know, there's 25 MPs in the Rada now, in the parliament, recruited by various political parties from civil society organizations, leaders of them. This is first sign. Uh, as far as I know, communicating non not on reforms, but with civil society activists across Ukraine, many of them are going to be elected in the uh, local elections in this October. But for that, they should be supported, of course, by people there. And some of them uh, are going to replace old-style administrators in the administrative uh, hierarchy of the president. It's a good sign.